Again, my name is Carlos Crespo. I'm a, a board member of the Oregon Latino Agenda for Action. I also work at Portland State University. Uh, one of the things that we did last time, which is, was to be able to recognize those members of the community that have made a great impact in our community. And those members of the communities, some of them are Latinos, some of them are allied to our, our community and have made a great impact. So today we have two awards. Uh, one is the Gloria Wiggins Award, and the other one is the Ally for Excellence Award. Uh, the Gloria Wiggins Award is named after a native of Colombia, Gloria Wiggins, who served the Latino community for over a decade, decade until she lost her battle with cancer in December 2011. Gloria began her work at Catholic Charities El Programa Hispano in 2000 as the Educational Service Coordinator. She soon became the Division Manager of El Programa Hispano in 2002. Under Gloria's leadership, El Programa Hispano developed as a primary social service provider for the Latino community, mainly in Gresham. Gloria was also a founding member of the Coalition of Communities of Color. She sat on many advisory committees and was present to advocate for the Latino community whenever it was needed. The Multnomah County Citizens Involvement Committee honored Gloria with the Gladys McCoy Award for Lifetime Volunteer Achievement in 2010, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce presented her with the Latino Community Service Award in 2011. Gloria always made time to listen and offer advice and support to community members. She never forgot about why she was advocating or she never lost sight of the real reasons behind her social justice work. Gloria's spirit lives through the programs she helped build, such as El Programa Hispano, the staff that she mentored, and the community that she supported. And I believe we have a family member, uh, Mr. Wiggins. The Ally for Excellence Award, the Latino Ally for Excellence Award has been established this year to recognize an individual or individuals who has made significant contributions to the advancement of Latino leadership throughout our state. A true leader that recognizes the Latino abilities, contributions, and leadership deserves our recognition and respect. The winner of this year, Gloria Wiggins Leadership Award is Irma Valdez. Irma Valdez is an immigration attorney and a managing partner for Jarosh Valdez. Irma is an extraordinary individual and a tremendous advocate for the Latino community. We have several people uh, nominated Irma. These are some excerpts from uh, their nomination. As a civil rights attorney by training, Irma has an immigration law office in downtown Portland. She refuses to turn anyone away regardless of their ability to pay. I wish many more attorneys do that, and more physicians do that. But anyway, that's a separate topic. And as a result, Irma donates about 50% of her time on a pro bono basis. Irma's pro bono services not only include her clients, but also families from Catholic charities, immigration counseling services, the Mexican consulate, and even the local immigration court. Irma gives regular presentation on issues important to working class Latinos and regularly consults with local public service organizations on Latinos issues including Adelante Mujeres, the Latino Network, the Oregon Community Foundation, and others. Irma founded and chaired the Latino Home Initiative, a nonprofit dedicated to transforming working class families from renters to homeowners. Her seven year service on the City of Portland Planning Commission led to the name change of the 39th Avenue, and this was not an easy task, to what now is the Cesar Chavez Boulevard. Thank you. <laughs> and it's nice to see that sign, they write the accent, you know, it's sometimes it's Chavez, but it's Chavez, and the accent is there. Irma is courageous and will not stand silent in the face of injustice. She speaks out when others remain silent, and that's why we believe she embodies the perfect recipient of the Gloria Wiggins Award. Please join me in congratulating Irma Valdez. Irma, please come. Thank you. All right. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say that when I got the call, I was, I almost fainted. I have to say that it's an honor. I never had the privilege of meeting Gloria, but I do feel like her spirit is in this room. And I have to tell you that when I got the award, this is gonna be shocking for some of you because I have such a gigantic voice in the communities that I uh, sit, in the commissions that I sit in, when I talk to the mayor of the city of Portland, when I talk to Congresswoman Bonamici, I have a gigantic voice. When I got this award, I humbly receive it from the immigrants that I represent every single day of my life in my office. Every single day in my office, I am devastated with stories that would break your hearts. That's why for me, the number one issue for us as Latinos, don't be blind. It is immigration. Immigration reform is the issue of our time. It's the civil rights issue of our time. It is families in concentration camps in Aristia, New Mexico. It is Obama deporting more families than in the history of the United States of America. Latinos, we are gonna create a new political party. Don't listen to the Democrats or the Republicans. Our families are under attack, okay? Be very, very clear, our families are under attack. Why do our children not do well? Because they don't know if their parents are gonna stay. If you resolve the immigration issue, and it is a civil rights issue, Martin Luther King would be marching with us right now, say, wake up, we need to march. This is a civil rights issue. If you solve that issue, our children will do what Irma Valdez has done. I came from Michoacan, Mexico as an immigrant. My parent worked at farm, as farm workers in California. They went to the city of Chicago to work, hardworking people. I naturalized in the East Coast. Straight A student, I got a scholarship to Brown University to study with John F. Kennedy Jr. Elizabeth Warren's daughter was my roommate at Brown. All our little kids in Oregon that are in school right now have that legacy, have that ability. If you do not do something about immigration, you are denying them that opportunity. I love what John, John F. Colon says, you must always be present. I am always present. I don't care if you're the only one in the room, you're privileged to be here right now. When I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., the only Latina who spoke Spanish, the only Latina they've ever hired, I would be in those meetings talking to Eric Holder, Janet Reno, Bill Clinton, why they should not prosecute Jose. I was in a policy position sticking my neck out because I was the only one in the room. When I worked for Mayor Daley at the city of Chicago, I would be the one saying, the gang task force only goes to 26 in California, Pilsen, where I grew up. Why do I keep seeing my friends from school that they didn't get a ticket like I did here being prosecuted? I was the only one in the room. And I knew when I speak up, I'm gonna be on a shit list for the Latino community and for the people in this office, but I always, always, always speak up. When I was on the planning commission, my feelings are hurt toward all of you. I've been on the planning commission for eight fucking years, and I've never been listed as a dot on your chart. I was doing all that work by myself. When the 39th renaming came before me, how many of you were in the room to support me as I was sitting with racist colleagues? Nobody. But I stood up and said, this is the right thing to do for our community. And I single-handedly, Irma Valdez single-handedly made sure that we got recognized. When I was working with the His uh, Hillsborough Chamber of Commerce, my friend Tom, stand up. This is ironic. That man is fantastic. That's an ally for you. I was at the chamber, always speaking up for our community, and Tom's staff reached out to me that I live in Portland. Who remembers the issue back in Hillsborough almost 10 years ago? The loncheria issue, right? Portland's all hip with its food carts now, but they started in Hillsborough with Latinos. 
and they were having an issue with, do we license them, do we not? Irma was in the middle of that conversation, and that's a great man right there that I'm so proud of you for honoring. He's always stuck his neck out for Latinos. So what's my message to you? Is it a message of Irma's hostile, she finally got her award? Absolutely not. I love my community, I love you guys. I think we're the luckiest people on earth. We are so lucky to be Latino, and I feel it from the bottom of my heart. We are so lucky to be Latino, the food, the culture, the music, the ideas. We are going to change this phenomenal, wonderful U.S. nation for the better. And you have to believe that in your heart. That's what's going to make you stand up and say, this is what's right. And let me tell you a story. I'm honoring Gloria Wiggins with everything that I'm telling you because that's what she wanted you guys to hear. I had a consultation yesterday, and you should understand this about me. I don't have consultations. That's such a ridiculous word. When I meet with people, I'm meeting with my family members that need my help and my guidance. And I have a young girl that came to me two years ago that has straight A's, but she does not have a green card, right? We all know this story. There hasn't been reform for more than 25 years. So she gets what? Deferred action. A little education. What's deferred action so people finally know? It's fucking nothing. It's a work permit, and you tell the prosecutor and the immigration authorities, I'm right here, you can take my name and information down, just let me stay. So one of these little kids gets this opportunity to stay. She doesn't have to renew that opportunity to stay for another seven months. So I find it kind of odd that she wants to come in to talk to me. So she comes in to talk to me and my heart sinks. She's depressed, she's gained weight, and she tells me, I met some guy online. How many in here are parents? Raise your hand. How many of your parents? Raise your hand. Have, how many of you have siblings, okay? She comes in, she trusts me to tell me, I met somebody online, some whack job I've never met, and I don't have any status here, nobody loves me in the United States, so I'm willing to take the risk to leave. Is that a consultation? No. That's Irma Valdez as a parent being present, as a friend, as a Latina who gives a shit to put the legal ease to the side, and have a heart to heart and say, I know why you're depressed. I promise you, Irma Valdez promises you that America cares, that there will be reform, that you do not have to leave this country to meet a guy you've never seen because he's promising you something better in another country. I leave you with that because I hear that every single day. Every single day I hear devastation after devastation after devastation. And I have hope. I acted like her mother, like her friend, like her mentor. I acted like the person she wanted me to be. And I told her, you're not leaving. I gave her homework and I said, I'm going to see you back January 1st. And how do I know she's going to come back? Because she trusts me. Because I put myself out there every single time. And she's looking for a mentor. She's looking for leadership. So I am grateful for the award. I'm sorry if I sound like I'm lecturing, but this is our moment, this is our time, this is a great country, create alliances. There's an alliance sitting right next to you. Thank you so much. Wow. Fearless. Uh, one of these years, winner of the Ally for Excellence Award, uh, we met her earlier this morning, is Dr. Andrea Cook. She is the president of Warner Pacific College. Uh, as the president, she has altered the trajectory of this college to make sure that the institution is uniquely positioned to serve the rising demographic of the Latino Oregonians in the next 20 years. She has formed and is implementing a multifaceted strategic plan that removes educational barriers for low income, first generation, and underrepresented students in Oregon. Dr. Cook has returned, has reduced barriers to higher education opportunities by controlling tuition, a very important topic nowadays. In 2008, 
Warner Pacific College lowered tuition by 23%. We usually hear the opposite. We raise tuition by 23%. Uh, she lowered tuition by 23% in an effort to make education more accessible. Under her leadership, Warner Pacific uh, established a loan repayment program called Freedom to Flourish that guarantees that Warner Pacific will cover student loan payments post-graduation for any student who graduates with loans and does not earn at least $37,000 within the first year of earning a degree. Those are guarantees that very few college universities are willing to make, and I work at Portland State University. <laughs> Warner Pacific also identifies emerging scholar leaders annually and provides scholarship to these students through the Act 6 Leadership and Scholarship Initiative. Over all 86 Acts, Act 6 scholars have been selected to receive the scholarship. 37 of them have been Hispanics. 95% of these 37 are either enrolled or have, been gra have graduated. Dr. Cook has also advocated for the rights of Latinos in Oregon through editorials in the Oregonian and give voice to our community. She is a model of ally to our community and we are happy to present her with the 2004 Ola Ally Award. I'm deeply honored and uh, grateful for this award. I, I agree that this is a critical um, civil rights issue. Uh, immigration, absolutely. We need to address um, the, the critical issues of immigration and the lack of opportunity that's, that people have uh, to access all the services. And one of those services is education. And for so many, because of, of their status, it makes them nearly impossible for them to go to school, and we're trying to address that each and every day here. We believe that education is so critical in preparing uh, students and people for their, for their work in the future and to be leaders, and so we are grateful for the little part that we get to play in serving students of the Latino communities, and uh, we love them and uh, feel so privileged to be able to serve them here at Warner Pacific College. So thank you so much for this honor. I'm very grateful. Thank you. And thank you for allowing us to uh, visit your home and have our conference here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Our other winner of the Ally for Excellence Award is Metro Council President Tom Hughes, and you've heard already about him. <laughs> Mr. Hughes is a native Oregonian. He was born in Hillsboro. He attended Hillsboro High School. He graduated from the University of Oregon. He was a teacher at Aloha High School. Uh, his public involvement starts at the city of Hillsboro. Uh, he's been part of the uh, Hillsborough Planning and Zoning Board. And listen, this, this is how the trajectory starts. Uh, later, he was appointed to the uh, Hillsborough Planning Commission. Then he served in the Budget Committee for Hillsborough High School. He also served as a county committee before he became city councilor. Then he was elected as Hillsborough Mayor for two terms. And during his administration, he promoted public participation into the city's futures uh, planning throughout the Hillsboro 2020, 2020 vision. In 2010, he was selected Metro President. Mr. Hughes, we're giving you this award because you're our ally. But more importantly, as we have heard, you have advocated for the representation of Latinos in government agencies and all the places that you have been part of. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I just want to say that I, I am very deeply honored to receive this award uh, and a little, um, a little perplexed and, and quite moved. Uh, what I did as mayor of Hillsboro and the progress we made in Hillsboro or tried to make, it seemed to me was just the natural thing to do. Uh, I couldn't, I can't and couldn't see doing it any other way. We are a community that is uh, that 
whose Latino population is growing, it's dynamic, it's vibrant, and it brings a level of vibrancy to the community that we've been striving for for a long, long time, and to not welcome, honor, and seek representation from that community in our decision-making processes simply did not make sense. I would like to, to take a quick opportunity today uh, to uh, share this award with three people that I think, uh, some of whom you may not, some names you may not be familiar with, but I think are important, particularly uh, to the development of the Latino community in, in Washington County specifically. Uh, the first is a woman by the name of Ruby Ely. Uh, many people here today, uh, even those of us who are as long of tooth as I am, perhaps don't remember Ruby. Uh, Ruby was the executive director of the Hillsboro uh, unit of the Valley Migrant League, which was a federal program back in the 60s, that um, attempted to uh, deal with the needs of the migrants as they came through on the migrant stream. Uh, and uh, it needed a variety of, of services. Ruby decided that the service they needed the most was help in, in dropping out of the migrant stream and settling in some place, and that some place would have to be Hillsboro. Uh, that was not the mission of the organization, and it put her at odds, uh, ultimately to the point that she got fired for doing that. But in the process of Ruby's work, uh, she settled out and found permanent full-time jobs for a number of young Latino men who became what in Washington County are now known as the 12 original families. Uh, they've been there for 40 years. Their children and grandchildren have accomplished huge uh, uh, amounts of things on their own right. And all of that got started uh, with that 12 original families, and they wouldn't be there without Ruby Ely. Ruby later uh, tragically was murdered in uh, pursuing justice down in uh, South America. Uh, my brother is the second one that I would mention, John Hughes, uh, who passed away a couple years ago, and John was the deputy executive director in the Hillsborough Opportunity Center, and uh, with a kind of jolly goodwill went about uh, building relations with the Latino community that uh, lasted him an entire lifetime, uh, and he carried it with him to the job that he had when he passed away, which was the uh, drug-free and safe school coordinator at Sunnyside High School up in uh, central Washington, which is a community that has an overwhelming majority of the population is uh, either Latino or Native American. And uh, he found uh, a, a community that basically had a, a, an entirely Anglo leadership that uh, spent a good deal of their time trying to pretend that there were no Latinos or Native Americans in their community. Uh, and so he worked very hard trying to get Latinos elected to city council and to school board with, with some measure of success. The third uh, individual that I think deserves recognition is uh, Emilio Hernandez. Some of you may be familiar with Emilio. Uh, Emilio was one of those 12 that settled out of the migrant stream, took the risk uh, that uh, of the sort of certain certainty of the migrant uh, travel uh, and took a risk that he could, could keep and maintain a job and raise a family in a community that wasn't altogether sure they wanted to welcome him. And uh, Emilio's leadership uh, <clears throat> organized those folks and led to the creation of Centro de Cultural, uh, led to the creation of Virginia Garcia and ultimately uh, Adelante Mujeres. So those three institutions out in Washington County and beyond now <clears throat> owe their existence uh, to people like an Emilio and uh, the others in that original group of folks. Without their leadership, we wouldn't be where we are. And without your leadership, we won't move forward. Uh, and I think that that's the message. I am surprised at the number of old friends that I have in the audience today and the number of those friends who have been working at this for a long time <coughs> who are seen as either young or emerging leaders. And I think that speaks to how long we have turned our back on this community 
uh, because they've been working at it for a very long time. Uh, Luis Neva is uh, playing an important role with my, my organization right now with Metro in terms of introducing Metro uh, to the broader Latino community. He's been on our uh, community outreach committee and now serves as an alternate on the Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee, again talking about trajectory. Uh, and uh, eventually I would like to see him play a bigger role uh, in Metro's decision-making processes. Uh, but there are those kinds of things in every community in the region. There's opportunities for everyone who wants to play a role. And there are uh, those of us who have been at it, probably some would argue for too long, who will uh, be happy to, to lead you uh, and help you to guide you in terms of how you find those positions. So uh, I want to thank you again for this award. Uh, it, is, uh, it will take a place of honor. Uh, in my uh, in my trophy case at home, and uh, and I will uh, look at it fondly and and uh, think of you often. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move to the next stage of the agenda and uh, we are about ready yes jessica okay <laughs> okay luis okay thank you so much and please can we have another round of applause for those wonderful <laughs> honoris thank you so much well, I'm the new one in the team here, and they give me the hardest work right now to introduce the keynote speaker. I'm gonna try to do my best. Okay, uh, Marisa Madrigal, Chief Operating Officer for Munoma County. Marisa grew up in Los Angeles, Mexico City, in Rayfield, Washington. She earned credits from Clark College, while he is still in high, which she is still in high school, and entered the University of Washington at 18, holding junior status. After graduating with a degree in zoology, she began writing up and publishing a local magazine. Since her arrival at Munoma County in 2006, Marisa has worked to ensure all residents have access to the government. To the government access, uh, to the government access means that when people come to one of our buildings, they feel safe. They feel they can give input and feel like they are being here. It, it also means we are transparent, providing service and information in a way that is clear and accountable. She says, if we can communicate with people, we can serve them. Marisa serves in, as interim Munoma County Chair for 10 months in 2013, after an opening was declared by the Board of Commissioners following the previous chair resignation. Now, she is Chief Officer of Chief of Operation Officers overseeing day-to-day -day operations at the county and making sure Chair Kafuri is well informed. What I want to provide for Chair Kafuri, Marisa says, is the right information at the right time with the right level of detail so that she can make the best decisions possible for the organization. Marisa is married with two children, a four-year-old boy and an 11-year-old girl. She lives in Southeast Portland, where she enjoys, enjoys spending time with her family, working in her garden and writing. She also loves Mexican cooking and considers herself a master mold maker. Mole, oh, I'm sorry, mole, oh boy, you see? They, 
they give me the hardest work. Sorry. But now without this paper and myself, yes, it's a tremendous honor, a big, big, big privilege to introduce our wonderful Maritza. Maritza Madrigal. This is a tough crowd to say you're a master mole maker in, you know. <laughs> I'm not challenging anyone. But you can come over, we can share recipes. My name is Marisa Madrigal. I am a mother, wife, and daughter. Last year, I was honored to serve as interim chair of Multnomah County and I currently serve in an appointed role as Multnomah County's Chief Operating Officer. In both roles, I've been the youngest and the first Latina. I've always been a little stubborn, a little bossy, a little opinionated, even if I only share those opinions with myself. <laughs> but to be honest with you, until last year, I never quite completely believed in myself. I mean, I believed in myself, but I didn't believe in myself. I deferred to other people. I stayed quiet more often than was necessary. I let my generally anxious and shy tendencies keep me from reaching for what I really wanted. What I knew in my heart of hearts I was capable of. What every person in this room is capable of leadership. And then, one day last year, the safe little career I had built behind the scenes while I raised my family was turned upside down. Someone I trusted, someone many trusted to be a leader, let people down and set off a series of events that led to my appointment as the interim chair of Multnomah County. Me an introverted, shy, 30-something Latina mother of two, suddenly chair and CEO of a $1.6 billion government responsible for clinics, libraries, jails, after-school programs, and more. As you might imagine, there were quite a few people who were a little freaked out that someone so young and someone so different was going to run one of the biggest public institutions in the state. And it wasn't a question whether or not I would do a bad job. It was a certainty to them. Because I don't fit the profile. I'm not a dashing young white man in a red tie with a law degree. They look at me, and what do they see? Do they see a strong, intelligent person who went to college at 16, became a mother at 24, and was writing budgets and negotiating multi-million dollar deals by 31. They see someone that they can't identify with at all, let alone evaluate. Someone who maybe looks like ugly Betty sister Hilda. <laughs> so I knew I had to prove myself from scratch this time without room for error in public. In the hours after it was announced that I would be the interim chair, I did five television interviews. My first television view and interviews ever. Because of course I had been so uncomfortable talking to the media in my previous roles that I always let other people do it. I always happily took the back seat but this time I couldn't. <laughs> I, really, I really couldn't. It had to be me. There was nowhere to run. I had to find that inner strength, set my fear aside, and do what is sometimes the hardest thing we have to do, have one, faith in oneself, trust in oneself, our intelligence, our knowledge, our place in this community that is ours. So at that peak moment of vulnerability, 
I decided to crack open my shell and be myself. Because who else was I going to be? Within myself, I found peace, composure, and truth. From that place of authenticity, the words came. So I did the same thing the next day, <laughs> and the next day, and the next day for almost 10 months. I worked with wonderful colleagues, like the incredible Commissioner Loretta Smith. Commissioner Smith, would you please stand? I just, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being here in solidarity with us today and for being a friend and mentor and colleague um, during the worst part of my professional life. That turned into a wonderful thing, but I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> Together, my colleagues and I, we got things done for our community. We expanded Sun Community Schools to 10 new schools. We supported Commissioner Smith's million dollar initiative to address racial and socioeconomic disparities. We funded a mental health program to divert people from jails and hospitals into more appropriate community-based care. Was it easy? Nope. Did I make everyone happy? No. But do I sleep well at night knowing that I pulled myself up, stretched myself, dared myself, to fight for what was in my heart? Yes. Was it worth overcoming my fears and my doubts? Absolutely. And of course, in a fairy tale twist, I didn't even dare dream of the new chair of Multnomah County, Deborah Kafori, hired me as the chief operating officer to continue much of the work we started. So I'm currently in a very, very beyond my wildest dreams place in my life. I continue to have the honor of working for my community. I share all of this with you because when I hear other people of color and other women saying the words that echoed in my head for so long, I'm a behind the scenes kind of person, or I don't do politics, or I like to do the work, but I like someone else to be out front. I cringe. <clears throat> Because what I know now is that those words are holding you back. Those words are keeping you from shining as brightly as I believe you can. While those words might feel safe, they won't keep you safe. You can't count on other people to speak for you. But you can count on yourself. I will never be able to speak to the beauty and authenticity of your story, your moral authority, and your power better than you. If you ask me to, I will try my best. I will be present, like Irma. So will other allies. But you are the best advocate for you, even with all the vul vulnerability and risk that comes with it in our society. Sadly, in Oregon, Latinos are vulnerable most of the time. Our hair, our skin, our accents, our food, the things that make us beautiful and unique are used by others to make us feel small, powerless, not of this place, but of some other place, invisible. So choosing to put ourselves out there on purpose, inviting it, feels crazy. <laughs> So we need rooms like this, where we can draw power and courage from each other, commiserate, plan how to participate and make our voice heard in the dominant power structure. What does that structure look like? It's the school board, it's city hall, it's the legislature, but it's also your school's parent-teacher association, your local chamber of commerce your neighborhood association, and local advisory boards and commissions. Go. Go because you belong there. This is your home. This is your country. Don't wait for an invitation because you don't need one. 
While you wait by the mailbox for your invitation, your neighbor, the one with the no 188 sign, is at the school board meeting fighting for his kid. His wife is at the neighborhood association complaining about the new apartments going in because they think they have their fair share of brown people in the neighborhood. They have every right to go where they go and say what they say, but so do you. And as a nerd, I'm gonna ask you to get nerdy about it. <clears throat> Google your local government, look in your packet, there's some great resources there. Call the city or county and ask how to get involved. Pick a meeting and go. Introduce yourself to people until you find someone who looks you in the eye. Sit and listen, sit and speak up. We know how to work hard, so work hard at it. Teach yourself how to navigate the system. Then bring a friend and teach them. Figure out who has the power to make decisions. Call, write, weigh in on things people don't want or expect you to weigh in on. Google wants to come to town. How do you feel about that? The city of Portland would like to pass a street fee to pay for sidewalks. Do you have an opinion? School districts are redrawing boundaries. Have your say. Psychologists at UCLA recently published a study demonstrating that as the United States moves toward a majority-minority population, that is, as Latinos and other people of, of color approach 50% of the total population by 2043, support among whites for racial and ethnic diversity drops. Why do you think that is? Fear. Fear. What else? Power. power. That's number one, power. There's another one. What is it? Identity. We challenge the American identity. Some whites, not all, and you know this, believe that our mere presence challenges the idea of American identity that they feel they represent the best. So you know what that means. You may not have heard about that study, but you know what that means because you already experience it. Let's get it out on the table. Let's confront our fears. It means that as you start showing up to these meetings that you haven't been showing up to, as you claim some uncomfortable folding chair next to a table with bad coffee and stale cookies, that's what they have at all these meetings, just so you know. <laughs> some people, not all, but some people aren't going to like it. And they aren't going to like it in this primal way that comes from a place inside that has festered for generations. They won't be nice, they won't make it easy, and you should still go because it will still be worth it. To change the face of leadership, to change the face of power, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. None of the good stuff comes without sacrifice. But you know the sacrifice makes you tough. It keeps your eye on the prize. To me, the prize is a vision of our community where your seat at the table isn't determined by who your parents are. It's worth it to be able to speak my truth our truth from a place of power is so hauntingly, beautifully worth it. It makes a difference. It changes the conversation, and it changes decisions that are made. And as many people who don't like it, there are more people who will support us. Other allies of color, white allies who share our vision of an inclusive, equitable future, we need to go to them in the spirit of partnership. We need to ask for help when we need it. And we need to help them in return because there is no shortage of suffering in this country in every ethnic group. Some final thoughts. Take a moment to look around you. Look around this beautiful room. Take in the beauty of this moment. Take a selfie. Do what you need to do. 
reflect on the path that led you here today? What were the ups and downs? What were your wins and losses? Tears shed, blood spilled. Your story not only gives you the authority to speak about your experience and on behalf of others who share your experience, but it liberates you. When you embrace yourself, you demand that others accept you simply by being, by being present. And when you remain yourself, you retain your power instead of submitting it to someone else's ideal. Quietly staying in the room, or loudly, as your authentic self when the dominant culture doesn't want you there is sometimes the most radical thing you can do. Refusing to buy the hype that you are the other and claiming your space in the community is to claim your power. It might take every fiber of your being to resist the urge to run back to safety, and sometimes you will. You will run back to safety, and that's okay, too. The people's struggle is not about perfection. It's about progress. Progress that we'll make together for ourselves and our children. Believe in yourself. Believe in each other. Thank you. Hello, hello. Please, please, yeah. big applause <laughs> for our Maritza. Yeah? If I was more technological, I could do it. <laughs> okay, now we have a wonderful opportunity to ask questions to our Maritza. So please, there is some volunteers with the microphone. So we we'll start with a question. Okay. How did it, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what was your biggest motivation? How did you push through all those negativities, all those doubts that you had? Because I know for me, being a Latina and being undocumented and going to college and kind of starting an organization, like I sometimes doubt myself, like, how do I help? How do I can, how do I outreach to people and not doubt myself and trust myself? Well, it's, it's hard, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing struggle. You know, it's a daily practice for me. You know, I, I still have doubts. I don't, I don't know if that ever goes away. Um, but a couple things motivate me. One, it really makes me mad when people doubt me. <laughs> um, when people underestimate me. It used to make me feel bad, now it just pisses me off. Um, and so I've learned how to use that to kind of light a fire under me to show people and you know, to prove them wrong. So that's, that's one, that's sort of more an, an ego thing. The other thing is I, I don't feel like I have a choice. I have children, I have a family. I need to make this world better for them and for their friends. And um, you know, what's that compared to me being uncomfortable? It's nothing. I need, I, I'm gonna be uncomfortable if that's what it takes. I'm gonna cry if that's what it takes. Um, so I think it's, you know, again, what are we trying to do here? We're not trying to do something simple, so it's hard. Um, and that's okay. And if we screw up, so what? We'll just try again. Um, but we are fighting for something really important. Um, and if we don't, no one else will. So. Another question? Marisa, you made me so proud. I loved your speech. Likewise. I just love you. I want to say for the Deferred Action uh, student, and I want to say this from the bottom of my heart being in this room, that's why I'm a badass, because sometimes you guys cannot be in the forefront. I am not going to sacrifice your status to put you to be in a room to testify, but you better believe that I take Marisa's advice and I am present for you 
every single day of my life. And that's what I meant when I say we have to be present because our community does not have a voice. That's right. Another question? Um, I always post on my Facebook, I'm the only Latino in the room again. That's <laughs> the story of my life for the 16, or 16 plus years. But anyways, so strategically, mm -hmm. when you are already in the table, you have to establish, right, that infrastructure or that system that will open the doors for others. Right. When we think of Latino, we also got to think about the other mm -hmm. groups that are not represented. Yes. So, one or two advices of strategically establishing that infrastructure that will open, that will make that system flexible so others can also be there. So you don't have to always be the only one, but you will have that voice, yeah. collective voice. I think the most important thing we can all do is first, everybody in this room should know all the organizations that make decisions in our community. So there's some of those things I listed, the things in your packet. First, we have to arm ourselves with knowledge and test those systems. So if we're the first one at the table, we've got to gather what Im information about the people's body language and who really has the power in the room. Is it the chair or is it you know, somebody else, a, a neighbor or whatever? Um, and then we need to share that with people. You know, I feel like so often we work really hard and we're like, oh, we're the, we're the only ones there, and then we don't talk about it. And um, we can't operate that way, because I think we won't change the structure. You know, the first person in the room has their foot in the door propping it open, and then you gotta kinda get the other one in there, and then get your friend in behind you, <laughs> and then get your other friend until it's open, and then someone holds it while everybody runs in. And then all of a sudden, just the presence changes the structure, right? It's a lot harder to ignore people when they're in the room. So, um, you know, and then I think the next step is run for office. You know, be, there are lots of people in this room who are going to talk about it later and how to take, how to take that leap, you know. I was appointed to a leadership role, but I ran campaigns for a long time, and they're brutal. And it takes a lot of resources and a network. Um, we need to change the composition of the elected bodies in the state of Oregon to reflect us, and it doesn't now. Um, I had a question. Um, so you mentioned earlier uh, about at one point, you, you were like in the background. You were doing all the work, but you preferred to stay uh, not in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a little bit of a question for feminism. Um, I'm wondering, I have a cousin who is going to Portland State, and she's a very bright young girl, very hardworking, very dedicated. But I notice those kind of tendencies in her as well. And I, you know, we, we have a lot of Latinas who are just like that. Um, but what are we, what should we be doing to encourage them more to take that lead, because we have a lot of strong women, but we need them in those leadership roles to represent our communities. Um, what are we missing? What, are, what do we need to do to get them to that point? This is an excellent question, and I thank you. I love you for asking. Um, you know, I, it's hard to kind of identify how I ended up that way. I mean, I think it was like a mixture of genetics and culture. Um, I have a younger brother who is famous, <laughs> um, and he, he kind of just was always out, out front. Um, and it's not like my parents weren't encouraging, they were, but um, I think it takes sort of repeated, it takes a lot of people um, saying over and over again throughout your life that you, you can do it. It's not a matter of if, it's matter of when. You can do it when you choose to. Um, and that they're, um, the only risk is being uncomfortable. The real risk is staying back there behind the scenes. Um, 
you know, and finding, um, finding young Latinas, other women, Latina or otherwise, who inspire them and who can help them work through some of those things when they come up, when they have choices. Sometimes they have a choice, and other times Latinas are just passed over. That happens a lot. We're invisible. Um, and so we really need to seize those opportunities when they come our way, when we have a choice to be up front, and we need everybody behind us supporting us in, in doing that. Uh, with your words, with your hugs, with your emails, your Facebook, whatever, whatever it is, pumping up our young Latinas. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Thank you so much for all your talk, for your leadership. And now we would like to uh, give you an award for all your leadership, for all your example, so please. Thank you. <laughs> Please, one more round of applause for our Maritza. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Before the break, I got a question to ask. Did I pass the, did, did I pass the test? No break. Okay, we are going to have 10 minutes break, please, before the next session. Thank you. <laughs> 